Okay, a word about uh, the applied level before we head into this uh, week's outlook. Uh, whether or not I'll be adding to the portfolio construction series. Yes, I will. Uh, but um, every year from about March to about June, I have to do CFA work. That's part of the deal I have. And then after that, I can uh, focus on uh, building out this series. So uh, I am on that, uh, on that task right now, the CFA the CFA side because while well, I still do that but I will be adding uh, to this but we do have quite a bit in here now uh, setting up your screens setting up a buy and hold allocation uh, if you want to uh, uh, work with theta theta allocations screeners on how to find particular types of stocks uh, working with momentum uh, theta extensions allocation factories we did a carry trade uh, how to trade Forex both spot and futures uh, rebalancing the buy and hold allocation, loss reduction to elimination when a position goes bad on you, how you can use options to minimize your loss or even eliminate your loss, uh, how to roll options forward, how to set up an equity market neutral portfolio, uh, buying duration, how we can replicate TLT by buying the bonds ourselves and doing, doing better than TLT would, uh, commodity futures, uh, hedging currency risk if we buy a currency in a different uh, buy stock in a different currency how can we head, hedge the currency risk and uh, short selling so there's quite a bit in there um, this fall for the second part of it what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run my portfolio so you will you will have a week to week look uh, at what I would be doing now I can't show you my actual portfolio but I what I will do in the paper portfolio is replicate every single trade uh, because there are certain things, well, I just don't want to show. <laughs> uh, but I will replicate uh, every trade so that week after week you'll see you'll see the positions that I'm actually taking and how I'm uh, how I'm actually doing things. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and um, there'll be another module this fall on financial on financial forecasting. I don't know how useful it's going to be for a retail trader. But we should at least be able to, to understand a financial forecast model, a three statement model, so that when we're looking at one, if somebody, if, if we find one, we, we can at least understand what we're looking at and we can look at the assumptions and we can at least play with the assumptions to say, well, I don't think it'll be this, I think it'll be that, just to see what happens to the price target that we come up with. Because the forecast, those are all just magical numbers. Everything is the assumption. If I give you the 10 assumptions, that's all you need. Uh, those assumptions, and you could say, well, are those assumptions reasonable? Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll do something on that. I just haven't decided whether to do Tesla or Meta. I want to do something a little bit more complex than DR Horton because I was going to start there. I think, I think I keep leaning towards Tesla because it, it, it is a car company, but it has some venture capital ideas within the car company and I think that's a nice uh, exercise to go through because you wouldn't use the same cost of capital on each one uh, so uh, I'm kind of leaning leaning towards that um, anyways um, the for the portfolio construction and management uh, there is quite a bit in there now and then I will be adding my own portfolio view which doesn't really have from week to week is not going to have like one simple idea it's just going to be a collection of everything of everything that I'm uh, that I'm doing okay let's go I came across this story and uh, as I read it I, I couldn't quite figure out whether it was funny or tragic um, Uber and Lyft are gonna stop operating in Minneapolis after the city hiked the minimum wage for drivers uh, the city had changed their assumptions on how they get to minimum wage uh, change your assumptions quite a bit, um, which would cause rates, the, the charges, the fees that Uber and Lyft have to charge to be uncompetitive, uh, in which case there, there would be no money to be made. So this, uh, this group of people here, they're wearing t-shirts, MOLDA, that is the Minnesota Uber Lyft Drivers Association. Uh, and they're uh, looking uh, to get uh, wage increases and they're all happy that city council uh, passed a resolution raising the minimum wage such that these drivers must be paid a certain minimum wage now. So, um, in response, 
We are dis this is Uber. We are disappointed the council chose to ignore the data and kick Uber out of the Twin Cities, putting 10,000 people out of work. Now, the city council didn't kick them out of the city. Uber and Lyft made the decision that, well, if you're going to do that, uh, you know, it, we can't operate uh, under those conditions. Uh, our rates would be uncompetitive if we had to cover that. Part of the uh, part of the the uh, deal that city council is looking for is that when an Uber driver is not driving, they're still being paid, as opposed to only being paid when they drive. Right now, since they're being paid when they drive, uh, there's a certain amount of hustle involved in getting to the next to the next ride. Um, if they're not getting paid, or sorry, if they're getting paid while they don't have a driver, it's like, well, what does it matter? I'm getting paid anyways, right? So um, Uber and Lyft decided that it doesn't work with their business model. If that's the way you want it, we, we unfortunately have to leave. So this group of happy people are happy that they're going to get a higher wage uh, with no job. I mean, what does it matter, right? Um, they changed their assumptions here. City Council used a calculation of $1.40 per mile and $0.51 cents per minute. Uh, however, uh, in 2022, when they uh, were looking at this, they used estimates of $0.89 cents a mile and $0.49 uh, cents per minute. The $0.49 to $0.51 is not egregious. The $0.89 to $1.40, uh, that's, what, 75% increase? Um, Costs, transportation costs haven't increased 75% over those two years, but they, they decided to up that by 75%, which was just uh, one ride too far. So these happy people, uh, as of May 1st, will not have a job. Let's begin with some data. Uh, CPI was the big story last week. TLT came back down to settle just under 93 for uh, someone... Uh, previously, who was asking whether or not we would have another opportunity, I had uh, I did mention CPI. I said, well, if it comes in a little bit hot, uh, TLT will will drop. There will be a nice opportunity to sell puts again at the 94, 93 level, which I think is is a good place to sell puts. Let's see uh, where our problem is here. Um, we came in at 0.4. This is a headline at 0.4. Look at food zero kind of moderating. Now that doesn't mean prices are going down. Look at the, they, they rose every month. They rose at different rates and uh, we have one month of sideways, which I wouldn't read too much into that. Uh, energy, uh, 2.3. And uh, in this video, I will explain why I think energy is probably going to continue to go up. Uh, all items list food and energy still at 0.4, 3.8% over the year. Remember the target is 2% on PCE, and PCE usually comes in lower than CPI, so this is just, this is CPI here. Uh, this is a commodities, 0.1, that is not bad. Uh, unadjusted, uh, negative 0.3, but 0.1 on the month. If we look at services, less energy services, this is where the weight is, 61%, came in at 0.5. Uh, we have uh, shelter at 0.4. It breaks down to this. Owner's equivalent rent is 0.6. Rent is 0.4. So our uh, inflation is still happening, uh, especially with the big weighting that OER has. That is really uh, pulling things up. Came in at 0.6%. Uh, percent. I wonder if the, now it's lower in the PCE. The weighting of that is much lower in the PCE. So the PCE will be more important, but this... Uh, overall wasn't you know wasn't a data point that's going to help the Fed but nothing ever drops like this uh, if you look at it over a longer time period if you're looking at the 12 month average it it can do that but if you're looking at the month to month it tends to do this right it'll drop and then it'll do this kind of thing it always does that kind of thing it never just drops in a straight line so month to month you can get all sorts of readings going on so Looking at the three month, the six month, and the 12 month makes a lot more sense. The 12 month did drop, but it did not drop by as much as expected. And on Thursday, we got PPI. That's what we're looking at here. And if we were looking to get some help from PPI, uh, we did not. Uh, total uh, final demand up 0.6. And you can look through 2023. You had a little bit of 0.6 here, but it's being fairly benign. Uh, all the way through, and we're back at 0.6. 
Uh, final demand, less food, energy, and trade all the way through 2023. Very well behaved. January 0.6, February 0.4. Both of these readings well above uh, what the 12-month uh, was. And I do have uh, a theory on this that I'll share in this video as well. Okay, let's look at rates, money market rates, all well behaved out to the six month with the one year bringing in some uh, pessimism about rate cuts. Capital market rates almost across the board a full basis point uh, increase. So over the last week, we have had a bear steepener. And <clears throat> on the back of two hot inflation reports, CPI and PPI, that's not surprising. If there had been strong retail sales, stronger than expected, it probably would have been worse. So I think retail sales sort of held it down. Looking at uh, curve inversions, uh, we are 606 days now on the 2-year to the 10-year. The longest inversion was 1978 to 1980 at 638 days. We are 32 days away from setting another record. Um, on the three month to 10 year, 490 days. And I couldn't find the longest inversion. Fred's chart doesn't go back far enough and I couldn't find anything else quick enough uh, to put in here. So I thought, wow, well, I'll just keep searching uh, for the longest inversion there. I'll, I'll hopefully I'll find something. But I imagine it can't be, uh, we can't be too far away from the longest inversion being that the two year to the 10 year is 32 days away from setting a record. I don't see it uninverting in the next 30 days unless the Fed comes out on Wednesday and says, oh no, we thought we were done raising rates, but we're going much, much higher because you got to get uh, this bear steepener to keep going to uninvert. Uh, or the uh, three-month rate has to drop considerably in the next 32 days. I don't see that happening. So I think it's almost a foregone conclusion that we are going to set a record on the two-year to 10-year inversion. Looking at the uh, Fed balance sheet, SOMA uh, runoff of $3.4 billion down to $6.9226 trillion. The balance sheet itself down to $7.5 trillion. Increased uh, $3.1 billion, and being that we had a runoff over here, the net increase was $6.5 billion. Money market funds, money still flowing in to money market funds. However, if we look at funds flows for bond bond funds money is flowing in there if we look at money uh, funds flow for equity markets it's three weeks in a row with inflows money just keeps flowing in where's it all coming from retail 7.38 billion institution up 23 billion both up on government and uh, mixed on prime we are now three days away from the fomc the decision is i think a foregone conclusion we're at 99 percent right now on zero and I think that's what happens, no change. We also get the SEP. I expect it to be little changed as well. I don't know over the last 60 days, uh, uh, less than 60 days, that we got the last one, December to January, February, March, the last 90 days, if enough information has come out to really change the SEP very much, I expect it to be little changed. Uh, I expect in the press conference they'll make some sort of statement about the QT taper uh, perhaps later this year. This is the first meeting where Powell said they are going to talk about uh, QT tapering. So they're going to have some kind of idea about it. And I think probably later this year uh, it starts to happen. And if there's a question about level of ample reserves, I think it's uh, around $2.5 trillion. Uh, Canadian PPI in one day, CPI in two days, and we get the Bank of Canada deliberations in three days. That's like the Fed minutes, but for the Bank of Canada, we get that in three days. So lots of CAD risk uh, in terms of the currency. And if you're in uh, fixed income uh, in Canada, you have some fixed income risk here. In the U.S., not much in auctions. You've got a 20-year auction, which is an odd tenor. And then uh, the 10-year tips, I don't expect that to have much, much effect. Thursday, you have Bar. Same with Friday. And Friday, you have, uh, you have Bostic. If anyone's going to move the markets, it's probably Bostic. Going out to June, this is interesting. Uh, last week, uh, two or more rate cuts, 16%. That's pretty much gone, 3.8%. Uh, no rate cut went from 26.6 to 43.3 uh, by June. No rate cuts by June. One rate cut 
52.9, it was 57.4, pretty much unchanged, but uh, most of the weight that was on the 5 and the 475, roughly 12%, uh, migrated upwards. Effective federal funds rate, obviously still sitting at 5.33. Next week, we'll be sitting at 5.33. Nothing's going to happen this week. Uh, but the lag will probably be down 50 basis points. It's 75 right now. Here is something interesting. Uh, the reverse repo uh, dropped to 413. This is a new low, 413 on its way to zero, uh, down by uh, 31 billion. So based on where we were uh, sitting at the end of the year, at the close of December and where we are here, divided by the number of days, we get a runoff per day. I'm just doing a linear interpolation of where we are, runoff per day. Divide the 413 by that runoff per day and figure out uh, when you hit zero, June 26th, last uh, week it was July 3rd, now June 26th. That'll change every week depending on the runoff. But we are on our way to zero. Uh, so the uh, QT taper is going to is going to uh, uh, be part of the conversation because once that hits zero, all that runoff is most likely going to come out of the reserves. TGA sitting at 748 billion. Yellen's target is 750 billion at target, down 12 billion, and uh, reserves 3.57 trillion, down 47 billion. So you're down 31 billion on the reverse repo, down 47 billion on reserves, uh, which um, that uh, that uh, eats away at the ample reserves level. Um, so if we take the reverse repo and reserves and add them together and, and subtract out what I think ample reserves are, which is 2.5, you've got about another 1.5, a little under 1.5 trillion of runoff, of balance sheet runoff before you before you'd have to stop. That's 14.13 months. So that's a year and two months, and then you'd have to stop it. The Fed says they don't want to just stop it, uh, that they want to taper it out so that they continue can continue balance sheet runoff for a longer period of time, which makes a lot of sense. You don't want to go to a certain date and stop and say, is this ample? I mean, we don't know. Is this ample? And find out after. What you want to do is you want to slowly bring it down so that, you may decide, nope, here is ample, because you slow down into it. You'll find that spot a little bit better, given that reserves uh, do have some volatility. Uh, so I do expect some discussion about when they think they're going to start to taper. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd probably put it in late third quarter or early fourth quarter of this year. Um, because uh, at this, at the rate that it's coming down, uh, 14.13 months, you don't want to, you know, say, oh, it'll be done in six months. Let's start tapering now. I think now's the time to start the discussion of it. Real rates, uh, over 2% on the 20 and the 30, the 10 year, even the seven year threatening uh, 2%. Heck, even the five year threatening 2%. Uh, it is upward sloping. Our break-even rates are downward sloping, which we would want to see. Uh, that's telling us that inflation expectations are anchored at the longer end of the curve that we do see, or the market does see it coming down over time. Looking at Fed funds futures, quite a bit of movement here. Uh, Q2, 10 basis points lower than where we are now. Uh, implied rate of 5.23. Going from the end of Q2 to the end of Q3 is another 23 uh, and a half basis points implying one rate cut in the third quarter and in the fourth quarter dropping to 4.7 uh, another drop of 29.5 basis points implying a rate cut there uh, total is 63 basis points versus 75 on the last SCP I think we're still going to see 75 on this one I still think long the December Fed Fund futures make sense I think that they will probably have to move faster than what they think uh, let's keep in mind that uh, most of their SEPs have been wrong. Uh, they chased inflation on the way up. They thought unemployment would increase dramatically. It never did, uh, which, you know, in, in their defense, surprised a lot of people, including me. Uh, but I think that, that, that um, they'll continue to chase it on the way down now. So I think three probably doesn't change. I think it's more like three to four. Some discussion that, well, with the election coming up in November, 
the two meetings before, they're not going to want to influence the election. They're going to do nothing, which really leaves them only, only a couple of meetings to cut rates if they want to cut rates. I, I, I kind of think and I kind of hope uh, that they will ignore that and with blinders on simply just do their job because if they hold off on doing uh, a necessary act because an election is in front of them, uh, they are in fact being political at that point because they, if they, if they were, uh, uh, if the right move is to cut 25 basis points and they don't because they don't want to influence an election, you are in essence influencing the election by keeping rates higher than they need to be. So no matter what you do, you're going to influence the election, so you may as well just do your job. Uh, I don't know if that's the same calculus they have. Uh, TLT did not have a good week, down 2.91%, sitting just around the $93 mark, I still think uh, is a good time to sell 93 puts, 35 days to expiration, has $1.46 in there, that represents 1.57% of the strike. Implied volatility slightly, <laughs> slightly back. After a week like that, I thought for sure the premiums would be really nice. You look at uh, the 13-week IVP sitting at 2%. No one, no one really thinks there's a lot of downside here. There's not a lot of put buying going on on TLT. And that's why our implied volatility is remaining is remaining low on this is because no one's driving up the price of puts by buying puts. Uh, I think the market has it right there. There's no need to buy puts. I think selling of the puts makes a lot of sense. When you sell them, uh, you're driving the price down. When you drive the price down, it squeezes out the implied volatility in the put. And I think that's why it's remaining low is because more put selling going on if there, well, whatever action in the puts is probably happening on uh, the sell side as opposed to the buy side. Uh, so, yeah, for fixed income here, I think a long December Fed fund futures, I think continuing to sell 93, even 94 puts. Now, the 94 put would be in the money uh, because TLT is already below that. But as TLT rises back above 94, which Wednesday probably has a good opportunity to do that, uh, you make that, you make the whole premium. So the 93, 94 is out to the next April expiration. Um, I think I think look good. Big drop in mortgage rates for the week, down 14 points. Now, in all fairness, this is only to the 14th. The 15th was uh, you know a rough day in the market. Um, 6.74 Thursday over Thursday, the 10-year increased 20 basis points, uh, and we have a 14 basis point contraction. So the spread increased 34 to 245. Mortgage apps ending March 8th up 7.1%. This week, we get some housing information. The NAHB housing market index for March. Previous read was 48, which is in contraction. Does it break 50 and go into expansion? Uh, that would help the home builders, although a lot of the euphoria is built into the home builders right now. I think the next leg up is when rates do start to get cut. Uh, Tuesday, building permits uh, and housing starts for February. And Thursday, we get existing home sales for February. Uh, after this screen, let's take a look at uh, S&P Global, the MBS index, and ICE uh, the mortgage technology. Uh, they have a, a nice report out for March. Spreads, spreads continue to contract. 94 basis points on investment grade. High yield at uh, 315. Um, look at triple C, 8.49. Double B under 200, now 1.94. One, 1 Last week, I had the SIFMA chart up showing issuance, and there was very little convertible debt that was issued. Well, that has changed in the last two weeks. Uh, 11 deals, about $6 billion have been announced. Coinbase, uh, $1 billion. Uh, yield of 0.5 to 1%. It hadn't been priced yet. It was just announced uh, it'll have a yield anywhere from 0.5 to 1% with a conversion premium 30% higher. Than where the stock price is. MicroStrategy did 800 million at 0.625 and is going to do another 500 million uh, to buy Bitcoin. Uh, and these are convertible. So if it buys Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin keeps uh, going up. They're going to have a low cost on, on the debt that they're using and the debt buyer has the option of participating in that upside. SoFi, 750 million out at 1.25. 
the issuance of convertibles year to date, 18.2. Uh, this is, and we're not even at the end of uh, Q Q1 yet. All of Q1 for 2023 was 12.9. So issuance of convertible securities uh, up quite significantly. Very low yield. The the uh, benefit of this comes from the bondholder having a long call uh, on the underlying stock, and they're going to pay for the long call. Uh, through a lower yield, so you can get really nice debt um, by using convertibles. Uh, convertibles will dilute uh, eventual ownership. If if there's a belief that your stock price just can't go up, no one's going to buy convertibles. So in bear markets, who you know who's going to buy convertibles? You need a strong bull market to do it. So this could be a sign that more investors and more companies believe that this bull market is a real bull market that can run for quite some time. Okay, and let's start with uh, ICE Mortgage Technology. <clears throat> Once you get to their site, uh, click on Resources, and you'll see something for Data Reports. Click on Data Reports, and then click on the March 2024 Mortgage Monitor. It'll give you a highlight of uh, the points. Uh, if you want the whole report, just click on Download a Report. Uh, and they put this out every month. And you will get uh, a long report. I think, what is this, 28 pages? If you're into the housing market and you want more data, more granular data, <clears throat> this is interesting stuff. Delinquency rate down 20 basis points. Foreclosure starts up 43.2. That's interesting, right? Prepayment activity up 1.4%. Uh, and it's just a bunch of charts. National delinquency rate of first lien mortgages, uh, you can see 3.38%. The 2000 to 2005 average is 4.61. This light line across here is the record low. You can see delinquencies are almost at record lows. In fact, it did set a record low in 2023. Uh, and some pretty interesting chart, foreclosure starts by mortgage type. Uh, this here is the spread, the 30-year mortgage to 10-year treasury spread. The spread is on this side, and these are the yields on this side. So we can see where the spread is over here. It's this sort of shaded uh, a chart underneath, uh, which is a little over 250 basis points. Spread for the longest time was under 200, but 180 is, uh, is about an average, and we're um, 250, 260, uh, so we're significantly above that. But it's, uh, it's got a lot of neat little charts and a lot of uh, data and presented nice and visually. So if you are wanting more information on housing on a monthly basis, uh, I would recommend uh, ICE Mortgage Technology. Let's look at S&P. Uh, they have an MBS index. Uh, here you could just click on what you would like to see. I have it based on yield to maturity, so you can see where the yield to maturity is here. Uh, on the index itself, 5.13%. Uh, and this is GSE, a government, uh, uh, government sponsored entity. So they do come with an implicit government guarantee, so they should be rated double A. We go over to corporate credit and look at double A, 5.03% on, uh, on a basket of double A bonds uh, or an index, you get the 5.03%. You're 5.13 on the MBS, slightly better. You look at the AAA 4.86, you're getting 5.13. Uh, you can do better on, uh, on corporate bonds, obviously, but corporate bonds don't have the implied government guarantee, so uh, the index is, uh, is quite nice here. Um, <clears throat> now, depending on the MBS that you buy, the bond that you buy, you, you'll be in and around the 5.13, probably, but not exactly uh, at that. I still think that MBS given that elevated spread between the 30-year, the, uh, 30 year, sorry, the uh, 30 year FRM and the 10-year and the 10-year Treasury still represents a nice opportunity, especially in uh, the agency, MBS agency space. Uh, so you can download the fact sheet here and their methodology for uh, the index construction as well. If, you're, if you want more data on, on that sector, I'm just trying to give you some ideas. I don't think I'm going to revisit this every week. There's not enough interesting information here uh, on a week-by-week -week basis. It's just more for your, uh, your resource list. Okay, let's uh, run through some interesting charts here. I'm just going to draw a line right here. 
above the line is NVIDIA, below the line is Tesla. Let's start with NVIDIA. Ended the week at 878.36, a volatile week. Tried to peak above 900, and uh, nope, not having any of that. But it's still, week over week, up 3.08%. So on a week over week chart, uh, you still have uh, uh, upward movement. Next week, uh, you have NVIDIA's AI convention, which begins on Monday. Uh, two things I think that are being looked at is the possibility of introducing a new chip. Um, is this is where they're going to talk about it? And um, are they going to talk about what the size of the market is, the total addressable market? So these are two things that could be bullish for NVIDIA and push it up. Bank of America this past week uh, put a new price target on NVIDIA of 1100 from 925 now, previously I had said that, uh, you know, NVIDIA is going to have competition. The question is, can NVIDIA move faster than the competition can move? Uh, and NVIDIA doesn't necessarily have to get competition from selling chips. Uh, it can get competition from other companies that just rent the chip. In other words, you want to train your model, why not use our servers? You don't have to buy uh, your servers to do it. You can just train on our servers. Um, interesting story I came across about uh, uh, Cerebrus Systems. Sam Altman is an investor in this. Their WSE3 chip built by Taiwan Semiconductor uh, on 5 nanometers. So compared to NVIDIA transistors, 4 trillion versus 80 billion. Size, 72 square inches versus 1 square inch. Petaflops, 125 versus 4. And cores, 52 to 1 ratio. In other words, it's got 52 times the amount of cores that NVIDIA's H100 has. Uh, so it is far, far more powerful. Far more powerful. Um, as an example in the story, uh, they said that they could, uh, a, 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 an AI model that would take 24 days to train, uh, they can do in one day in one day on, on this system instead of 24 days. They do not sell this. They do package it in some hardware and they sell hardware, but they don't sell, they sell access. Uh, and they have uh, some of their clients, the Mayo Clinic, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Department of Energy. So you're seeing some of these uh, um, competitors come up. It's not a direct competitor, indirect in the sense that you're not buying the chips, but what you want is to train a model you may not necessarily have to spend all of that money uh, with with NVIDIA if you can, especially if it can reduce the, the training from 24 days down to one, maybe you just need to rent space uh, for a couple of months and be done with it. Uh, so there is competition. It's not as if they have unfettered competition. There is competition, <clears throat> and I think we have to look beyond just buying servers. For example, today, uh, we don't think about if we want to host a, a, a site uh, a highly trafficked site. We don't think, well, we'll need 15 servers and we're going to have to find a data center to put it in. We just go to Amazon. We just rent their servers. Uh, going back to NVIDIA, implied volatility, 13 week, 85%, 26 week, 93, 52, 88, very heightened implied volatility. We go out to April 19th, 35 days to expiration. These look interesting. Uh, you have um, the puts, 10 delta and 20 delta put. Now, when I say 10, I'm getting as close to 10 as I possibly can. It's not exactly 10, but that's the 715 put for $8.50, 850 bucks, sitting at 878 all the way down to 715. Uh, getting more aggressive. If you think, well, uh, under, eight, under 700 or under 800, you'd want to own NVIDIA, especially with a uh, potential price target here. Well, not potential, actual price target of 1100. Potential. Uh, price target for NVIDIA uh, to get to 775, 1960, almost two grand on that put, uh, which gives you roughly $20 of downside on that. So your average cost would be 755. So if you feel, well, I missed, I missed the run, I should have bought it in the 700s. Here's a way to bet on it: uh, is sell the put. If it gets to uh, that price, well, then you have bought it in the 700s. If it doesn't, you make two grand just by saying you would have done it anyways. Uh, forward PE of 37 is not cheap. It is not cheap. However, considering its growth rates, well over 50%, it has a peg ratio less than one. It's probably, in, in terms of growth at a reasonable price, one of the cheapest stocks you can buy. The question you have to ask is, 
how long is that growth rate good for? If you think this is, look, this is a one year to two year build out and capacity will be there. In fact, there'll probably be over capacity and that growth rate will turn negative very quickly. Then this is a super, super expensive stock. Especially if you look at it on a multiple of sales, it's a super expensive stock. But if you think that this is a decade long build out, then this is a cheap stock, which is why next week, this question here, what is the total addressable market? Uh, for this. How much bigger is the total addressable market versus where where we stand in this infrastructure build out now? That's a big one. Now if that number is huge, or if they if they don't mention that number, then then everyone else everyone's still with the well I think it's a one year build out. No, I think it's a ten and you have that fight uh, that may be going on. But uh, if um, if bigger numbers are put out which suggests that this is five, six, seven, eight, ten year build out uh, uh, at these growth rates. Yeah, you could you could skyrocket a lot higher, but you're betting on an event here. <laughs> you, you're, 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 just keep that in mind. So you know uh, it still has a it still has momentum. It still has uh, respectable revenues and respectable growth that isn't going to go away in the next couple of quarters. So I I think the you know a safe play that I probably would do is the 10 delta 715 put for 850. Let's move on to Tesla. <clears throat> Absolutely different story here. Uh, things are getting negative. UBS, uh, new price target of 165, a rating of neutral down from 225. Wells Fargo, price target of 120 with an underweight. Uh, their, last, um, their last price target was 200. Forward PE of 52. Uh, growth rate of around 10% forecast for the year. You got a peg of 5.2. Super, super expensive stock. At the elevated price of NVIDIA, looking at its peg ratio, it's a super cheap stock. At the lowered price of Tesla, 163.57 down, over 100 bucks from, from its high a couple months back, five, six months back, it's still a super expensive stock. Uh, Morgan Stanley, um, uh, put a put out a uh, research paper about ice internal combustion um, and a couple of years ago two years ago I put out a video uh, that the ice age is is far from over and this is what the thesis of this paper was uh, the elongation thesis is that uh, the ice ice uh, manufacturers have a much longer tail than what we think they're going to be around for a much longer period of time uh, in that paper, Ford was their preferred pick. They have a price target of $32. I think Ford's around $12 now. $32. Um, I think selling puts on Ford, Stellantis, and GM makes sense, although Stellantis has really run up. You know, it's from under $20 to $28 now. Uh, so Ford and GM, I think, make sense because ICE will be us, with us for a long time. The CapEx will probably be minimized. They're not really spending a lot of money building out the EV side. Huge cash flows coming in. Uh, and I think, especially with GM, I think they continue to buy back their stock. Um, let's uh, get back to Tesla here. Down 1181 week over week, down to 163. Elevated implied volatility for sure. But the put selling isn't that attractive. If you look at the 10 Delta puts, 135 strike, uh, twenty eight dollars lower, which probably it can do that. You're only getting a buck ninety five for that. Uh, the twenty delta put uh, is at the hundred and forty five strike, uh, which is less than eighteen dollars, uh, eighteen fifty seven uh, lower, three seventy seven. I don't like any of those. I think uh, Tesla has got a good attractive price around fifty to fifty five dollars a share. Uh, so at least at least a hundred dollars to the downside. I wouldn't be interested in any of those puts. Um, first week of April, you're going to get deliveries for Q1. Uh, Deutsche Bank puts it at 427,000. The consensus seems to be somewhere between 425 and 435,000, uh, which would be flat over Q1 of 2023, which is 422,000. I mean, you're somewhere between 425, 435, we're at 427 here, call it 430. You did 422,000 last year, 430,000 this year is less than 2% uh, 
2% uh, growth. Uh, Evercore uh, says growth for Tesla will probably return in 2027, but that uh, the next couple of years are going to be uninspiring for it. Uh, so 163.57. I think I think there's more downside here. I don't know that that I would be interested even in the 10 delta put at 135 for what two bucks. Uh, I think I think you can break that 135. Uh, last time it dropped, it went to under $100 before it ran back up to almost $300. Now it's on its way back down. I still feel 50 to 55 bucks is a price on Tesla that I would say, okay, okay, I'm, I'll go long. At, uh, I'll go long here, um, but uh, certainly uh, not at 135 put. Okay, got to talk about copper. I have two charts on the screen. The uh, top one is uh, copper futures, COMEX copper futures, one year chart on HG. The bottom one is FCX. We are at a 52 week high, 44.63, peaking just above the 52 week high, which uh, we had back here. You got to go back to January 2023. Uh, so we're at a, what, almost a 14 month high on FCX. Um, I had been uh, saying uh, on HG in previous videos uh, that selling puts at the 365 or 360 level on HG made a lot of sense and, and it, it held uh, pretty much every time there was a nice opportunity there that would have had inflated premiums on 365. Uh, and selling puts on FCX uh, to get a long-term allocation uh, made sense as well. And we're up at 44.63. The catalyst for this was China. China smelters agree to cut production. They process 47% of the world's mined copper. What was going on is you have an overcapacity of copper smelters, but an undersupply of copper. Uh, because uh, down here, Panama, uh, you'll recall a while back, the largest copper mine was in Panama, and the Panamanians wanted nothing to do with it, and it shut down. So you have supply uh, which is lower uh, than than uh, uh, it should be and you have the uh, supply of smelters which is higher than it should be uh, so something had to give <clears throat> so you have smelters agreeing to shut down but to be fair uh, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a shortage of capacity it just meant that you're moving from over capacity to balanced capacity so you know, as much as I, I, I like this, I don't know that, that this is enough to sustain an ongoing rally in copper. Um, COMEX finished at 412 a pound. Shanghai Copper as at a record close. Uh, LME uh, at 11 month high. Uh, if we look at COMEX, this 412, uh, the last uh, time it was at this, this level was April 19th. It was at 416, closed at 416. Uh, so it's at an 11 month high as well. Um, I, I really want to believe <clears throat> that it that it can move up to 425 and 450, but it's just not enough news. You have an overcapacity in smelters, so you've you've agreed to close some of them, but you haven't created a shortage of capacity. It's not as if you're going to have all this copper waiting to be smelted, because of course that's what you need on the other end is what comes out of the smelter. You're still going to process the same amount of copper that exists. This is not a demand story. It's not even a supply story. Uh, well, you could say it is a supply story, but it's not a true supply story. It's a perceived supply story. I'm not that confident on this. And because I'm not that confident, uh, I'm looking at uh, call selling uh, down here. Uh, uh, so, okay, China has agreed to cut production on its smelters. Uh, but China was the largest consumer of copper previously. Not, you know, we know China's had some trouble for some time. Uh, its massive build out in housing uh, drove copper demand. Well, we don't have that anymore. Implied volatility for uh, FCX, 13 weeks, 74%, nice and high. Let's take advantage of that. Uh, look at the calls, the 20 Delta call has a strike of 50 bucks. The 35 Delta call, if you want to get more aggressive, has a strike of 47. Uh, you get a dollar nine for that. <clears throat> and I think the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the at the money is something like a dollar 80. You can sell the uh, the 45s for like a dollar 80. I think selling the 47s for a dollar nine makes sense. That would get you out at 4809. 
uh, on your on your exit, <clears throat> the combination of the forty seven strike plus the dollar nine that you would get. Yes, it's been a nice little rally here, but I, I just don't see the strength of it uh, because it is not a demand story. I wish it were. Uh, I'd rather see this happen on a demand story, but this is just a supply story. So I'm 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 just not willing to get on board for a $50 and a 55 and a $60 FCX at this point. Uh, but nice opportunity uh, to uh, sell the calls. And if it does breach that nice opportunity, I think to lighten up. Okay, now we have AT&T and Oxy. Uh, it seems odd to put them on the same screen, but they are related. Uh, AT&T has agreed to buy uh, CO2 credits from Oxy's uh, 1.5 unit. Uh, Oxy is uh, investing in carbon capture uh, and sequestration and can generate credits from that and can sell those credits and it's going to sell it to AT&T. 1.5 unit is building a facility in Texas called Stratos, largest carbon capture facility in the world. Well, you know, what else do you expect from Texas, right? Go big or go home. Uh, already has customers, Amazon and Boston Consulting Group. Uh, this facility uh, can sequester 500,000 metric tons per year. That is the equivalent of 109,000 vehicles per year in one facility. Now, uh, if you have this facility ramp up and it's selling these 500,000 and it's profitable, why wouldn't you do another and another and another, right? It takes 109,000 vehicles or it neutralizes. 109,000 vehicles a year. Uh, but put that in perspective here, 283 million vehicles uh, on U.S. roads, that is 0.04% of the total. Uh, 2,500 plants would be needed to neutralize 100%. So that is the total addressable market for the number of plants that you could build uh, to, neutralize, uh, to neutralize the fleet, 2,500 of them. Uh, IEA. Uh, is forecasting a tighter market for oil in 2024. Demand uh, is forecast to be up 1.7 million barrels per day, but supply will be down 870,000 barrels per day in Q1 2024. For all of 2024, demand uh, they're forecasting on average will be up 1.3 million barrels a day, but supply will not, will not keep up, will only be 800,000 barrels per day. Uh, so that can only help uh, oil prices and that can only help oxy. The other thing that is going on, which uh, is bullish for Oxy as well, is you have um, uh, M&A activity, especially uh, for uh, companies in the Permian basis. Uh, a lot of the private companies are being bought up. Uh, private companies are not as disciplined with their capital as public companies are. So a well that's producing, they'll, they'll let the well produce. But for a public company, if the well is not producing at a certain level, it's better to close that well down. And, and have other wells produced. So you actually will take all the record oil production we've had over the last couple of years, you'll actually take that down. Uh, and I think that is what is in uh, this gap, this 500,000 uh, barrel a day gap. So what can we do with this? Uh, AT&T, uh, as I said before, I've mentioned this before, $17 put selling uh, seems to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, April 19th, uh, the 17 put is 49 cents. If you had uh, sold the March puts, uh, they finished in the money. Uh, sorry, uh, they finished out of the money, which means if you sold the put, you, you earned the full put. They closed just above $17. Uh, I still think selling 17 put, uh, $17 puts makes sense. Uh, you have a free cash flow yield of 12%. You have a dividend yield of 6.5%. And of the three big networks, they're the only one with the explicit statement of paring down their debt. Both T-Mobile and Verizon have suggested that their debt is going to increase. Uh, they're paring down their debt. If we look at the tips ranking, uh, 10 buys on AT&T, 5 hold, no sell. Wolf Research has a price target of $21 uh, on AT&T, a one-year price target of $21. Um, this is not going to set the world on fire. This is, this is certainly not an NVIDIA or a Tesla or, or any of the uh, big names that get a lot of attention. It's one of these quiet names in the corner. But you can do quite well on one of these quiet names, uh, continually, 
continuing to sell those uh, sell those puts, uh, being that it's such a low price, the capital required uh, for the margin uh, is very low. So the return on capital on this one, the return on invested capital is quite nice. And if you get stuck with it, if it if it's given to you, you have some nice statistics backing it up. Uh, Oxy uh, implied volatility there is nothing. The 52, the 26, and the 13 are all at zero. All at zero. There's there's not a lot of money in these. Um, I'd advocated the 55 and the 5750 put selling, and uh, for quite some time, that made a lot of sense. Uh, we're at 62.39 on Oxy. You have consolidation going on in the Permian Basin. You have supply, which is going to be uh, taken off the market, which is going to support oil prices, and you have the IEA. Uh, also forecasting a tighter market. I think at this point it probably would make sense. There's the 60 uh, to, you know, well, might not see the 55 again, but use the 60 uh, and the 5750s uh, to get some kind of premium on this. Uh, or if you think that there's more upside uh, to Oxy that it could break uh, its highs, you might want to go out three or four months and sell the 66 uh, put. Or uh, buy, it being that uh, implied volatility is so low, uh, do a risk reversal on this, sell a put to buy a call uh, three months out. And give yourself a good 90 days on that. Uh, Oxy still continues to be something I'd feel very safe owning. Uh, AT&T is something that I would feel very safe owning. Uh, going back to the previous screen, NVIDIA at 715 kind of makes sense. And Tesla, I, I just wouldn't touch. Okay, one more set of charts here. <clears throat> they kind of look the same, don't they? You have Bitcoin here, uh, more correctly, BRR, the front month on uh, the Bitcoin futures. Uh, and you have gold, the front month on gold uh, as well. Look at them. Uh, whatever's going on is happening to both of them at the same time. Failed at 2200, failed at 74,000. Uh, here's your 74,000 level, failed there, peaked over there a couple of times. Here's your 2200 level, peaked over there a couple of times, but failed. Uh, and failed on multiple days for both. Uh, for Bitcoin, what's the story here? You have the halving coming up, which I explained uh, what that was last week. Uh, you have a bunch of ETFs uh, that sprouted up over the last couple of months that had fund inflows, and you have momentum uh, going on. Um, an interesting question for Bitcoin is what is the free float? You have 19, I think a 19.665 million coins uh, outstanding. So think of it as a company with 19.6 million shares. What's the free float? Because if insiders are holding on to 16 million, you got a very small free float, which means almost any activity uh, will cause a lot of price, uh, price movement. Uh, you could say, well, these aren't shares of a company, it's Bitcoin, uh, so the free float is all of it. Is it? Uh, criminals, uh, they're basically buy and hold by default. Uh, you can't, if you have, uh, you know, eight, 10, 12 million dollars in Bitcoin as a criminal organization, or if you got it from criminal proceeds and you're trying to get it out, you can't prove source of funds. Good luck. That, that stuff is locked into the digital world. Uh, you can only spend it digitally. Getting it out is going to be brutally, brutally difficult to do. Very difficult to do. Um, depending on what country you're in, you're going to have to prove source of funds. You set up a brokerage account, you connect your wallet to it, you start pulling out a million, two million, whoa, 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 whoa. There are going to be questions. Before any of that money can be transferred to your bank account, there are going to be questions, period. So. It's not part of the free float. Criminals basically are buy and hold. The large criminal organizations are basically buy and hold by default. And to suggest there's no criminal activity going on in there is the end of this conversation because that would be a stupid statement to make. Um, so the volume per day on Bitcoin is about 340 to 350,000 coins per day. 340 to 350 out of 19.65 million outstanding. Uh, you got 1.7 to 1.8% uh, of the outstanding trading per day, and there's the volatility that you're getting. I think the free float is, on this is is uh, quite small. Uh, I'd be surprised if it was more than more than 4 million, 3 million, 4 million Bitcoin. I'd be surprised if it were more than that. 
I think a lot of it is locked into uh, into digital wallets that you have organizations saying, how the hell do we get this out now? I know here in Costa Rica there was someone, I don't know who, from Dubai claiming that they had sold their uh, crypto business and they were looking to buy a house with crypto. <laughs> Good luck. That's never going to happen because you've got to prove your source of funds. If you can't prove your source of funds, you don't get it. Simple. So, so, so it's you. You can get you can get the coin, but then the only thing you can do is just spend the coin on other stuff in other places that will allow you to spend the coin. You can't get it out, uh, or you can only get it out at extremely high risk. So, for for uh, purposes of analogy in terms of a company uh, these are insiders long-term holders not part of the free float so uh, bitcoin i think will continue to be volatile for a while and the more uh, money the more bitcoin that accrues to these criminal organizations because they're not going to stop their crime they're not going to stop it the more that accrues to them uh, the smaller and smaller that float will get china uh, for gold, China, property prices down, equities down, uh, equities down now for three years. So where's money going to go? Not into property, not in equity. So it's going into gold. Bitcoin is banned, kind of, kind of. Uh, the, the policy from the top is that, yes, it is banned, but there is a gray market. Uh, and if you can cap each transaction at 50,000 yuan, uh, you avoid scrutiny. So it, it's going on. Even though it's banned, it's still going on uh, for uh, citizens who are a little bit more cautious. They're probably saying, well, yeah, why don't we just stay away from that? But we have gold, and that could be why Bitcoin and gold seem to be moving, uh, or at least their charts uh, look like it's almost the same thing. Okay, let's uh, have a look at SPY. SPY gave us another all-time high. 516.78 uh, this past week on March 12th, uh, but based on its closing, we are now 1.345% below that all-time high, but Wednesday, Wednesday could give it a lift. Forward four-quarter operating earnings, LSEG is at 243.31, basically unchanged, two cents, but basically unchanged. SP Global, 240.77, again, basically uh, unchanged, four cent difference. Uh, forward multiple of 21.14 versus 21.16, and the change was all multiple contraction because our earnings barely changed. The earnings surprise from uh, Q4 2023 up 6.3 percent above the consensus. So if we adjust the consensus by 6.3 percent, we get to a 19.89 times forward multiple versus 19.91. Uh, not much change over the week, but S&P dropped, I think, like 0.2% over the week. Friday, uh, options, the option story is getting more interesting. Friday, uh, um, expiration was uh, triple witching. Uh, so if we look at our months, January, February, March, April, May, June, it goes one, two, three, one, two, three. So you have, uh, you know, your witching day, your double witching, triple witching, and then it drops back down to one, two, three, and it's based on when futures contracts expire because options expire on them on the same day. So uh, they expire uh, quarterly, uh, March, June, uh, September, December. 5.3 trillion in notional expired on Friday and uh, volume on the S&P 500 was up 40% above its average. And that's probably because of uh, the options expiration. Goldman Sachs uh, has uh, said trading in options has surpassed trading in stocks. Uh, and this is the first time uh, with this expiration, it's the first time it's done that since 2021. So the euphoria in the options market is back. The euphoria in gold is back. The euphoria in Bitcoin is back. Momentum is back. Stocks that are hitting 52 week highs. It's exuberance, but is it irrational? All right, uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, semiconductor options. Semi options are at the highest level ever, ever. So we have a casino there for sure. Um, so there, there is some structural reason for uh, some, some stocks to go up. The more action there is in the options, especially call buying, how it works is you'll buy a call 
someone has to be short that call. That's usually a market maker that is short that call. Uh, and the market maker tries to run a balanced book during the day because it's on both sides of the market. It's buying and selling and buying and selling. But at the end of the day, depending on, on the volume, if there was net call buying all day long, the market maker will be net short delta and has to get to zero. And they usually buy the underlying to get to zero. So excessive call buying will cause at the end of the day for the market maker excessive share buying, which will drive the price up, which enhances the value of the calls, which creates a momentum footprint, which creates more call buying, which creates more share buying, which creates more in the money calls, and on and on and on. It goes until something breaks. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is ominous here. Trading in options surpassing, in notional surpassing, trading in the very stocks themselves and semiconductor options at the highest ever. Uh, so on a structural basis, you are, I think, at that point, entering some kind of frothiness. Is it irrational? You never know if it's irrational until it's over, but it certainly is exuberance here, right? Um, earlier, I talked about PPI, uh, and we saw January and February's numbers higher than they were through 2023, and I said I had a, a theory behind that. And about two, about two and a half years ago, um, I can't remember when. I, I wish I could find the video. I, you know, I'm not going to sit through hours and hours to find the spot where I said this. But I said that I think that we're entering into a period of large firm capitalism, where large firms will dominate um, and and just continue to gain uh, more share and more power. Uh, and large firms tend to have more pricing power. Uh, they they. Uh, a sort of inhibit competition. Uh, and if you don't have a whole bunch of startups and a whole bunch of smaller companies uh, that are introducing products and forcing the large companies to compete on price, um, you will get more and more concentration of profit uh, and pricing power into the large companies. High interest rates do not solve that problem. High interest rates only make that problem worse uh, because uh, small companies have to rely more on external financing uh, and high cost external financing than large companies do. Large companies have a wickedly big uh, um, advantage on their cost of capital, wickedly big advantage. The higher you hold interest rates at these levels, the more and more you will create an economy that is large firm capitalism. Uh, and if you have an economy that is large firm capitalism, they have pricing power, uh, and they'll use that pricing power to continually increase and improve their margins. Uh, so the paradox here is the higher you leave interest rates, the more likely it is that you're going to create inflation at this point. If, if we have this thing going on, if you lower interest rates, uh, you encourage a lot of entrance into the market. And that's what the Fed is worried about. If we lower rates, economic activity will explode. Yes, it will. So will supply. That's the point, right? Copper right now, that's a supply story, not a demand story. So the price of copper is going up. Why? Because the belief is that with the smelters down, supply will be restricted. It's not a demand story. Demand isn't exceeding supply. Supply is coming down and the thought is supply is coming down below the level of demand. Now, that's a supply story. Oil, that's a supply story. Uh, the IEA is saying that, 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 that supply is not going to keep up with the increase in demand. Uh, you have M&A going on in the Permian Basin, and uh, with the private companies being bought up, uh, many of their wells are being shut down. A thing to watch is the Baker Hughes, uh, the Baker Hughes rig count that comes out every Friday. And watch that rig count. It wouldn't surprise me if the rig count starts dropping. Uh, and if the rig count is dropping and more and more large firms are controlling the supply, you don't have all these small firms that'll keep pumping into rising prices. You've got these large firms that say, no, we're not going to increase production in rising prices. We're going to increase margins. Uh, that's a supply story. Housing, that is a supply story. Given the uh, level of interest rates right now, home builders have said uh, in their conference calls and in, in their uh, a, 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 um, the management discussions that uh, they're not building spec homes. 
They're not going into a, a, a development and building 120 houses and then selling them. Uh, they're building to sales. That, that once somebody says, I want a house, then they start building. Well, that keeps supply down because you don't have a bunch of houses hitting the market. It's a supply story. If you lowered interest rates, uh, you would increase these supplies. You would increase the supply. Uh, so you don't have to raise interest rates to kill demand. You can lower interest rates to raise supply. Uh, again, large companies have a significant cost of capital uh, inflation. Uh, sorry, a significant cost of capital advantage and inflation. The inflation we had was and is a supply story. It continues to be a supply story. It continues to be a supply story in the supply of small firms we have that would act collectively as competition and a price check on the large companies. Uh, it's a supply story in the, in the cost of capital necessary for small firms to compete. It's crushing. Uh, we, uh, or the Fed, I think, I hope, or the Fed, I hope, can think about the supply side for a while and think, well, with, with higher rates for longer, this really only benefits the consolidation of power in large firms, which, which do have the ability to constrict supply and manage price. So I think for the sake of inflation, you have to lower rates, not raise rates, not keep them elevated, but you have to lower rates. Uh, and I know it's a paradox, but if you lower rates, you'll actually, I think you will actually get lower inflation because it encourages new form formation. It encourages investment in productive assets. It was, uh, I think it was Bostic who related a story uh, about traveling around his district, why he's worried about lowering rates. And he was saying, you know, I've been talking to these companies saying, well, what if rates went lower? What would you do? And they said, well, we, we want to buy this piece of equipment, that piece of equipment, this piece of equipment. Uh, and he sees a big surge in demand for capital equipment. Uh, uh, that uh, could be inflationary. Well, if you're buying capital equipment, what's it going to do? It's going to produce more output. More output is more supply. That is deflationary. You see, there's the other side of the story. Yes, more capital goods will create inflation uh, initially when you buy them, but at some point that capacity will be online. If you have a lot of capacity, prices do go down. Um, so if we keep rates where they are at this level, mm, I'm not so sure that inflation will come down enough to get the rate cuts that I think that we should get. So keeping rates higher will result in keeping rates higher. Lowering rates would result in lower rates. I know it's a paradox, but that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. Anyways, uh, that's the end of this week.